Hello everyone. Thank you for standing by. And welcome to our webinar on Optimal Cord clamp Clamping sponsored by DrGreen.com and presented by Dr. Alan Green. My name is Chris Just, and I'm the Executive Director of Prenatal Education here at ISIS, a certified nurse midwife and your moderator this evening, along with Nancy Holtzman, our VP of Clinical Content, a pediatric nurse, and an IBCLC, who will be typing with you in the chat room. During the presentation, all participants will be in a listen-only mode. However, you may submit questions to the speaker at any time by typing them through the chat feature located to the left of your screen, or direct them to us on Twitter using our handle at Isis underscore parenting. We'll also take questions at the end of the presentation. Today's webinar is being recorded, and all of you will receive a link to the recording early next week. So if you miss something or need to step away for any reason, that's okay. ISIS Parenting is proud to host this evening's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers and online at isisparenting.com. And now I'd like to introduce our sponsor, drgreen.com. In 1995, Dr. Alan Green had a thriving pediatric practice in San Mateo, California. He was known for being an excellent pediatrician who worked with parents and kids on health prevention and development issues. He spent as much time as possible with each family during their office visits. He even gave out his home number to many of the families he worked with. Despite these efforts, he still found that he wasn't able to give each family all that they needed in terms of health care information. His patients wanted more of his time and expertise, but there weren't enough hours in the day. DrGreen.com went online in December 1995 to address this need. As I mentioned, I'm Chris Just, and I'll be your moderator tonight along with Nancy Holtzman on our chat. And it's my pleasure now to introduce our presenter for the evening. Dr. Alan Green is a pediatrician and father of four. He is the founder of drgreen.com, cited by the AMA as the pioneer physician website, and the creator of KidGlyphs, an iPhone app that uses graphics, spoken words, and text to help children communicate beyond their verbal skills. He's the author of Feeding Baby Green, Raising Baby Green, and From First Kicks to First Steps. He's deputy editor of the Journal of Participatory Medicine and a columnist for Parenting Magazine. Dr. Green is the founding president of the Board of the Society for Participatory Medicine and serves on the board of Healthy Child, Healthy World and the Lunchbox Project. In 2010, Dr. Green founded the White Out Now movement to change how babies are fed, starting with their first bite of solid food. In 2012, he launched TikTok, a worldwide campaign to change the practice of immediate cord clamping to optimal cord clamping. He appears frequently in the media, including such venues as the Today Show, The Dr. Oz Show, Good Morning America, Fox and Friends, The New York Times, The Wall Street Journal, USA Today, Time Magazine, Parade, and Glamour Magazine. Dr. Green received the Healthy Child, Healthy World Award for Prevention and was named the Children's Health Hero of the Internet by Intel. And now, here's Dr. Green. Thank you, Chris and Nancy. It's a delight to be with all of you this evening uh, to talk together about a really important topic. In economics, there are two kinds of goods. They're called rival goods and non-rival goods. The rival goods are those things that if I give it to you, then I don't have it anymore, like a bottle of pills. If I've, if I've got it, I give it. You've got it, I don't. Non and that would include something like a web URL also. I own it. If I give it to somebody else, then, then it's theirs. But non-rival goods are the things that I can give or share with somebody else, and then we both have it. And often with non-rival goods, the value goes up the more it's spread. And ideas are non-rival goods. I want to talk tonight about something, about something very powerful I want to give to you that we'll all have, and then hopefully we'll all share it with others, and it will spread around the world, creating better health for billions of people. And that idea is 
TikTok. And I'll explain what that is in a little bit. But first I want to explain that iron is essential to life. Iron is a really unique molecule, and it's there in red blood cells. What's so cool about it is that when the red blood cells go to our lungs, it can grab oxygen, pulls it in from the air, and when it goes out to all the different tissues in our body, it can let go of the oxygen. There's, not, there's nothing else quite like that that can hold on to something, grab it, and let go, and that's what makes it possible for us to, to breathe and move and fuels all of growth and all of childhood. So the iron is in a molecule called hemoglobin in the red blood cells. And the red blood cells are a really key part of our bodies, of kids' bodies. It's about 20% of all the cells in our body are red blood cells. They're necessary for fueling everything that we do. And each red blood cell has about 270 million hemoglobin molecules in there. But if for some reason we don't have enough iron, the the amount of hemoglobin begins to fall, the red blood cells start to get smaller, and there are health effects to that. We know when adults get low on iron, we feel weaker, we feel more fatigued, we're often more irritable, we get headaches as the iron level falls, often before you even have anemia. Anemia is the name when you get so iron deficient that you don't make enough red blood cells. And my presentation just disappeared. There it is. Anemia is the same when you don't make enough red blood cells. But before you get to that, when you're just iron deficient enough that you don't have quite enough iron for what you need, the big thing in kids is that it changes the way they think. They lose IQ points because of it. They're neuro, they're, there can be uh, they're long-lasting problems. Their cognitive abilities go down. Their emotional stability goes down. ADHD is higher. And in addition to that, their capacity to exercise goes down, to, to, to succeed at sports goes down. Um, big effects from iron deficiency. And in the U.S., about the, the lowest estimate is that 7% of toddlers in the U.S. are iron deficient. I, I actually like talking about iron sufficiency, the opposite of that. It's getting enough, having plenty of iron for growth, for development, and all the normal physiologic functions. And growth is sort of a key piece here, because at, at the time that a baby's born, they have about 500 milligrams of iron in their body, and it's enough for their, it should be enough for their red blood cells at the moment, and besides that, for their muscles that have iron in it, for enzymes that are needed to make neurotransmitters and to, to help the effect of dopamine in the body. They've got plenty of iron early on, they should. But what happens is, as every day about 1% of our red blood cells start to go away, they retire, and another 1% are formed. We recycle as much of the iron as we can, but babies are growing. In the first several months, they double in size, and they need a lot more iron than they did at the outset. And often, as they double in size, as they grow, they don't have enough iron to keep up, and it has big health effects that may not be picked up on that little screening finger prick blood test that's so often done in kids. You can be iron deficient with a normal blood test. So how, what's the scope of this problem in the U.S.? It's at least 7% of toddlers, and some estimates 9% or even 15% in some neighborhoods. But when your iron is low, even if you don't have anemia, you lose a little bit of IQ. And the estimate is that in kids under age five in the United States, there are about 9,409,500 lost IQ points in the U.S. just because of iron deficiency. Now, for each kid, that may not be very much, but it adds up to a pretty big deal. There's actually calculations you can do to see what the impact of that is on society. We know that for every every lost IQ point, there's about a $10,000 decrease in lifetime productivity. So as a result of that, we know that there's about $95 billion lost economically in productivity from just the kids who are under age five today as we speak. And that's in the U.S. Iron deficiency is a much bigger problem in, in developing nations. It's a global problem. There's about 2 billion people on the planet that are iron deficient enough to be affecting their productivity, their creativity, and their health. Their immune, they're more likely to get sick more often and to recover more slowly because of iron deficiency. And the World Health Organization has estimated that if we could just solve iron deficiency in a developing nation, we could increase their productivity by 20%. 
the, the picture on this slide is when I was in the Dominican Republic actually handing out iron to kids who were, who were in fact, both the last pictures, to kids who needed it because they were iron deficient. That's good, but it's not good enough. Because it, something really interesting about iron deficiency is that breastfed kids are at the highest risk, which seems so odd because breast milk is great for kids. It's the perfect nutrition. So why should they be at the highest risk? Well, formula has in it about 10 to 12 milligrams of iron for every liter, but breast milk only has like 0.3 so maybe as high as 1.5 if mom is really iron sufficient. But 1.5 compared to 10 to 12, I mean, it's like 10 times as much iron in formula. Now, the iron in breast milk is way better absorbed, but not enough to make up the difference. It's breastfed kids that are the most likely early on to get iron deficient. And that got me really thinking years ago. Now, breast milk is also low, appropriately low, in vitamin D. And why would that be? Because babies are built to get vitamin D from the sun. Throughout almost all of human history, it was by being outdoors, the sun would hit the skin, the skin would manufacture vitamin D, and that's where it was supposed to come from. Now, today's kids, um, some estimates are we spend as much as 93% of childhood indoors. And so breastfed kids may be low in vitamin D unless they get a supplement. But they weren't built to get it that way. So that got me thinking, where are kids designed to get iron if the levels in breast milk are so low? And here's the answer. At the moment that a baby is born, only one-third of their blood, or only two-thirds of their blood is in their body. This is the, the fetal blood that's been going through them all throughout pregnancy. Two-thirds in their body, a third of it is outside their body at the moment of birth, still in the umbilical cord and still in the placenta. And for almost all of human history, uh, the idea was the baby would be born and then the cord would pulse and it would actively pump that extra, some of that extra blood into the body. They'd get about 30% extra blood volume, lots of iron and red blood cells in that. And then once it started, the pulsing was slowing down and stopping, then people would cut the cord and would clamp and cut the cord and, and be done with it. But in the early 20th century, a little over 100 years ago, the idea became very popular to immediately clamp the cord. And they did it for a couple of reasons. One was, one of the biggest birth problems was that women were bleeding, were hemorrhaging at birth, and they thought maybe by immediately clamping you could stop hemorrhaging, which turns out to not do it at all, not help at all in that respect. And the other big thing is it gave hospitals a way to be able to intervene quickly in babies. So you would cut and clamp the cord and whisk the baby away and immediately evaluate them, resuscitate them, take charge. So this idea was called the active management of the third stage of labor from the delivery baby to the delivery of the placenta. It was supposed to be better for mom, better for baby, and it became widespread. Widespread in the U.S., widespread in the West, and then got exported all around the world as the best practice for delivering babies. And, and neonatal mortality was going down, so it looked like a really good idea. And the state of things right now around the world in the U.S. is estimated about 95% of the time we still do this immediate cord clamping in the U.S., and that's true in rural in every nations that's been studied in the developing world and, 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 and in uh, the, the most developed nations as well. It's become common practice, particularly where hospital births are done. But when it comes to iron, when you clamp immediately, you have 10 times the risk of developing iron deficiency anemia. So this idea has now been studied uh, in many different nations. It's been studied in the U.S., it's been, it's been studies done in Pakistan, and, and Zambia, and the U.K., and Canada, Argentina, India, Libya, Bangladesh, Australia, lots of places around the world. And it's been shown that when you just wait an extra 90 seconds or so beyond the typical, two or three minutes so the cord stops pulsing, that you, you dramatically reduce the chances of a baby becoming iron deficient. It's, it's, it's safe and effective. Now, a lot of, in the, the medical literature, this idea is called delayed cord clamping. And I don't like the, that term because I don't, I don't believe it is delayed. I think that waiting is, is normal. 
cord clamping or physiologic cord clamping. And I use the word optimal cord clamping because sometimes if there really is an emergency and you really need to whisk the baby away, it might be important to do it immediately. Although I'd prefer we develop tools and trays and warmers that could actually be right there with mom instead of across the room. But there's times when it should, may need to be immediate, times where you may not even need to clamp at all. And the, the thing to do is instead of out of habit, just doing it immediately, do it when it's optimal for that baby and for that mom. I just saw a, a statement by uh, Jacqueline Levine here saying that also immediate clamping prevented the baby from getting the heavy sedation that was being used in uh, moms. Um, and it is true that um, you did protect babies from whatever major drugs that were being given to mom at the time. So it was another value at the time. Now, a couple of questions that often come up, in fact, people sent in before tonight's time together, was what about for premature babies? Is, is, well, actually, before that, the question is what about jaundice or polycythemia, having too many red blood cells? And that's the biggest objection that, that I usually hear to this idea is that the baby is more likely to get jaundiced. And the reason for this is that where jaundice comes from is when those red blood cells retire and they start to break down in the body, um, they go through several changes, and bilirubin is one of the steps of breaking down um, the hemoglobin. It's this yellow color. It can collect in the skin, and if it gets super high, that's a, a dangerous problem. And there was a study that came out in 2008 by a group called the Cochrane Review. They, they go and they analyze all the studies out there and suggested that while this is generally safe, that jaundice is higher when you wait and that more of the babies get phototherapy. Now, since then, there have been bigger studies looking at that that say that jaundice is not, in fact, higher, that the idea of extra jaundice uh, is really a myth. But whether or not that's true, there's been a rethinking of the role of bilirubin in newborn babies. Uh, and let me give you a, sort of a sideways example. We used to think that fever was a problem, that fever was uh, something that we should fight because it was a bad thing for kids. And we now understand that fever is actually part of the body's way to heal from infections. It's a powerful, potent thing. Kids get better faster if they have a fever. In most cases, it's not dangerous or doesn't need to be brought down. Occasionally, if it's super high, it does. But in general, it's part of the body's activating the immune system and fighting off the germs. Well, it looks like bilirubin or jaundice is much the same thing, that it's protective for babies and protects them against a variety of diseases and toxins, that it's a potent antioxidant, and that if it's elevated some, kids do better. And it's only sometimes that it gets so high that treatment is really needed. So, A, it's unlikely that you actually do get more jaundice if you wait for optimal cord clamping. Even if you did, it may actually be a benefit for kids. And even if it were something where you did need phototherapy, the benefits of waiting to me far outweigh the risks of having phototherapy. So I, to me, this is not a reason to not do it. Um, another question that comes up frequently is what do you do in the case of a C-section? How in the world could you do a C-section and wait? And there actually are a number of OBs that have made that their routine now to do what they call delayed clamping, or I'd call optimal clamping, um, with every C-section. And there's a number of ways that they can do that. Um, they can have the baby's head delivered, and then the surgeon sort of his hands off for a bit while the baby's still attached to the placenta, and they have a little bit of time to start breathing. And then once the baby begins to cry, the shoulders are eased out, and then the delivery is this there's steady active movements um, by the baby, assistance from the obstetrician. The cord isn't clamped until the baby's completely delivered and the baby's well-being is confirmed. That's one way that works. Um, sometimes if you do have to move fast, you can just, they can what they call strip or milk the cord by sliding your finger and thumb along it to get some of the extra blood in. Some OBs will deliver the baby and then hold the baby just below the level of the placenta for, uh, for a minute or so before clamping. Um, so there, there are a variety of ways to do it. It can be done. It's not routine, but it is something that you can ask for. Another question that came in, in the people sent in was, what about premature babies? Does it work there in a neonatal intensive care unit? And for premature babies, I think it's even more important. And for, for a couple of reasons, where, 
where babies get their iron. Part of it comes at the time of delivery, but a lot of it comes at the end of pregnancy. That's when most of the iron accumulates. So if they miss that time in the third trimester, they especially need it. And it's been studied carefully in preemies, and the benefits include, besides the iron that we talked about are that those babies need fewer transfusions, they're less likely to get sepsis or severe infections in the nursery, and they're less likely to have head bleeds or strokes, a, a big uh, complication that goes with prematurity. So beyond the iron benefit, there's several really good reasons to do it in premature kids. But beyond all of that that we've talked about so far, and the iron story, I can, we can prove. There's, there are decades of solid research showing that this is better for babies and that it's safe. But there are other benefits that may be much bigger. The iron story may be just the tip of the iceberg, literally. So one of them is oxygen. Babies are born, or before babies are born, they get their oxygen coming through the, the placenta, through the umbilical cord. And shortly after birth, they transition and start getting their iron, or start getting their oxygen when they're breathing. And that there's something called the APGAR score that's given to babies at birth. It's a measure of how quickly they're making that transition um, from the placental circulation to getting their oxygen from their lungs. And everybody holds their breath till they hear the baby getting ready to cry. So what we've been doing when we immediately clamp the cord, besides keeping all that iron away from the kid, is we immediately cut off that oxygen supply that they've been getting for their whole life so far. And they may or may not be ready for that yet. I mean, you know what it's like to have your, uh, to have your head underwater for a little bit and have access to oxygen cut off. Um, it's, a, it's an urgent thing. Well, it turns out that what we call birth asphyxia, or not getting enough oxygen, is a serious problem. When you look at all of the newborn deaths around the world in a given year, about 29% of the time is from what we call birth asphyxia, not getting enough oxygen. Over a million babies every year. What would it be if by giving them oxygen till they're breathing well, waiting that two or three minutes, 90 seconds extra, and they got more oxygen, could that cut down on newborn deaths around the world? Beyond that, um, there's a, more than a million that actually die from not enough, enough oxygen. There's an equal number, more than a million, that just have some brain damage from not enough oxygen. The, the cerebral palsy is the, the big story about that. And those kids are getting almost enough oxygen, but not quite. What if they got extra oxygen at the time of birth? Could we reduce cerebral palsy around the world by simply letting the cord clamping happen the way it has for all of history? I can't prove that, but there have been several studies looking at it, and every one of them sees a significant difference. I, I think that it's a huge benefit there. Beyond that, the kids who, who don't die, who are, look normal, but do have what we call birth asphyxia, and that their oxygen levels go down, have a much higher rate of SIDS four to six months later. Could we lower the incidence of SIDS? Could, could more parents have their babies uh, not die suddenly and unexplainedly by just giving them that extra oxygen at birth? I think that may be true. That has not been studied yet. But by itself, to me, the immediate benefit of kids getting oxygen the way we were designed to be born, uh, I, I think is huge. But stem cells may be an even more important story than that. That umbilical cord blood is the biggest source of stem cells that babies get early on. It's why the cord blood banking movement has become big. In the last couple of years, we've learned a lot about stem cells. We, we, we really didn't understand them before. The stem cells are these young cells that could grow up to become in lots of different kinds of cells in the body. They're used to repair damage in a lot of different ways. And let me give you some examples just from the last couple of years that have, that have blown me away. One of them is muscular dystrophy. And we used to think that uh, muscular dystrophy was muscles that didn't work well. Well, it turns out that a lot of the time, it's actually normal muscle tissue in these kids. The problem is they don't have good, good functioning muscle stem cells. We all get damage to our muscles as we go along. But for some kids, most of us repair that damage and it's fine, but some kids can't repair it. 
What if they had extra stem cells? We also know that when kids go deaf from, uh, from nerve problem in the ear, like with some antibiotics, it's one of the big side effects. Um, we used to think it was from damage to the, the acoustic nerve, the ear nerve. But it turns out that's not the case. It's damage to the stem cells. We all get some damage to that nerve. Most of us repair it. Those kids can't repair it. So the umbilical cord blood is filled with stem cells that can go, go into the baby where I believe they belong. It's the first stem cell transplant. Now, that, that raises the question, of course, why, what about cord blood banking? Is that a good idea? And several people asked about that. And I, I think there could be reasons why, or could be good reasons for doing some cord blood banking. And it, this doesn't, there's not, you don't have to make a choice between the two. Um, cord blood banking is, uh, will work if you, you do it as the cord is, the pulsing is slowing and not quite yet stopped. After that, the blood starts to clot and the banking doesn't work well. But you can get a lot more blood into the baby. I said they get 30% extra blood volume, but about half of it, there's still plenty in the cord and the placenta to do the banking afterwards. So it's, it's not an either or choice. And, and I'm not here to say one way or the other really about cord blood banking, but I am here to say that incredibly valuable blood does not belong in the trash can, which is where it ends up 95% of the time actually is toxic waste. And, and, that, and that truly is a waste. I'm seeing that the sound is coming and going, and I don't know why that is. Sorry about that. So in medicine, we're told first do no harm. That is at the sort of the core of what medicine should be about, that when we intervene, we want to make sure that our actions are not hurting people. They're at, at, at the least neutral. Well, to me, first do no harm really applies to that very first medical intervention for babies. That routine immediate cord clamping is our first active intervention. It has known risks, higher risk, of, we, we're, we know it's 10 times the risk of iron deficiency, which is a major global problem and a major problem in the United States, and probably has risks of cutting off the oxygen and other things as well. Um, and there's no proven benefit. Um, there's a question that just came in from Daisy about, regards to John, is, are there benefits of optimal cord clamping for ABO incompatibility? And I'm not aware of that that particular issue has been looked at one way or the other. I know overall in kids, which would include that group of kids, that it's, it's, a, it's a good move. But the idea of first do no harm, of not intervening in a way that is actually without proven benefit, um, I think is one of the best ways to convince doctors about this. So this campaign is called TikTok. It's transitioning immediate cord clamping to optimal cord clamping. And the idea is to spread the word to 2 billion people around the planet by the end of 2013. This is one of those ideas that gets more valuable the more that um, more valuable the more that we share it with, with each other. And I believe that really can change. And I want to tell you one, one very hopeful sign. Uh, in 2011, we did this thing called whiteout. And the idea was to change uh, the way that newborn babies were fed. And for most kids in the United States, for 98% of kids, uh, processed white flour was the first bite of food. Uh, it was the only food that was given again and again and again and again. At a time we know that multiple exposures solidly imprint kids on flavors, it was the number one source of solid food calories for the entire first year. And when pediatricians were surveyed at the beginning of 2011, two to one, they were recommending processed white rice cereal above any other option for baby's first food. So um, at the so what we did for 2011 was a, a campaign called Whiteout. It was a very simple idea. Um, let babies' first food be a real food. Let their first grain be a whole grain when you do introduce grains. And did that by, uh, went with, spoke at ISIS and at other major parenting groups around the country. Parents started sharing the word with each other about this is no longer a good idea. And then the doctors started paying attention because people came in asking about it. And then when we wrote an article for uh, Medscape, which is a place where doctors get a lot of their news, it became the, the top-read story of the day on Medscape, and then the top-read story of the week, 
and then the top red story of the month. And in children's health, it was the number one red story by doctors over the entire year of 2011 because parents were asking about it. It was a simple, clear idea. And at the end of the year, Medscape surveyed physicians. Over 14,000 doctors answered the survey, and 93% said they would no longer recommend white rice cereal again. A massive change in a year. So it can be done. And I believe that as we begin to share the word on this, that this can change as well. So spreading an idea is far easier than spreading supplements. It's a uh, it is something that can go around the world and f with good reason because when you look at cultures around the world before 1913, every culture that's been studied would wait until the cord stopped pulsing and then they would, uh, and only after that would they, the, mom, the baby be cut away from the mom one way or another, but nobody would do it immediately before the 20th century, no culture. But it's not just people. It turns out mammals in general have placenta and umbilical cords. And when that's been looked at in mammals across the animal kingdom, they instinctively wait and watch for the cord to stop pulsing before they will sever the cord. Most mammals will do it with their teeth, and it's after the cord stops pulsing. So it's deep in our instinct to do it this way. It's not just humans. It's all of us, with just two exceptions. Of all the mammals that have ever been studied, there are two that don't do it quite like that. One of them is the giraffe. And when giraffes are born, the baby falls about six feet, and during the fall, the cord snaps. But that's a little different from us for a few reasons. One is that the giraffe, they stay inside for six months longer. So when they come out, they're already well-developed and have a good supply of iron. When they come out, they are themselves six feet tall. They weigh more than 125 pounds, and they're up and walking around within the hour. They're born much more mature. And even then, they have a, like a two-foot umbilical cord hanging off of the baby for several days. And, and you don't see blood in any videos I've seen of giraffes being born. Uh, so I bet that it's actually still pumping some of that extra blood back up into the giraffe, but that's one way to do it. The other animal that notably does not sever the cord with their teeth is actually our closest relative, or one of our closest relatives, the chimpanzee. And they, ver they basically ignore the umbilical cord. They pay, it's like they don't notice it, and they carry the baby and placenta around together, and at the end of about three days, it will dry up into a sinew and just kind of fall off on its own. But there is no animal that intentionally intervenes to try to immediately clamp the cord. So around the world today, more than a quarter million babies will be born, and probably 90, 95% of them, that cord will end up in the trash. And the, the, that oxygen, the red blood cells, all the immune cells that are in there, and the iron will be wasted. So the clock is ticking. Let's spread the word together. Thank you very much. Ready for any questions? Does anyone have questions for Dr. Green while we have them here? Please feel free to uh, put them in the chat field, um, and uh, he'll take a moment to answer them. All right then. Well, uh, we have uh, we want to thank you for all this wonderful information, Dr. Green. Um, and uh, now that we've come to the end of the presentation tonight, we'd like everyone to remember to check your email for the presentation recording, which we will send out within about two days. And um, and we just want to check one more time. Anybody have questions for us? Oh, Looks we like have there are several now. questions okay. coming in. Yes. Yes, they're coming and in now. Great. Okay. So here we go. So, um, so first question was: Does the cord have to completely stop pulsing? Oh, actually, before that, will the will I be speaking to groups of peds or OBs about this? Yes, I will. A bunch over the next year, speaking to, to pediatricians and OBs and uh, other birthing specialists as well as parents. It's going to be getting the, the word out across the board. It's going to be very important. And write an article for, for, um, for physicians as well. And does the cord have to completely stop pulsing or just slowing down enough? And the answer is that 
slowing down should probably be plenty. And even just waiting an extra 60 so most of the time the cord today is cut 30 seconds or less. And waiting, the cord usually stops pulsing two to three minutes. Sometimes it's a lot longer. Um, sometimes it's shorter than that. Waiting an extra 90 seconds is usually enough for a big benefit in the studies. Sometimes even waiting 60 seconds uh, is useful. Just getting a little bit of that extra blood can be a, a benefit. So it's not a black or white, all or none thing. I just wouldn't rush to do it unless you need to. Then the next question is, how do you compensate for a breastfed baby's low iron? Well, if you're able to do the uh, optimal cord clamping, you may not need to compensate at all. But otherwise, they tend to start growing beyond the iron supply they've got by about four to six months old. So exclusively breastfed kids, which I strongly recommend uh, and, and encourage, I do suggest starting to give some kind of iron supplement by four to six months. And that could be um, iron that's fortified into a food. It could be iron-rich foods would be a great way to do it if you're starting solids at that time. Or it could be iron drops. Then another question, do you foresee other practitioners fighting against this? Um, I do. Uh, people are, are, are saying what I'm hearing now, even though there are literally uh, dozens of studies looking at the benefits and no studies suggesting any kind of serious downside to it, um, what I hear a lot is there's just not enough evidence to do this. And I feel the opposite. I feel like, A, there is enough evidence. But beyond that, it, the evidence should be the other way. We're doing, we're doing surgery on these kids, basically. I mean, it's really simple surgery. But we're taking active intervention, and there should be evidence for that, which doesn't exist. The only thing that we see is that when that started being practiced, we started having problems. Um, so I think that pediatricians in particular will be a little scared because we really feel comfortable when we take the baby under our control and away from the mom and have them on the warming table. So people will be a little reluctant to do that too. But I think that people will get excited about it too. Um, next question was about the chimps practicing lotus birth. Yes, I should have said that the, the way the chimps do it is what's something that's called lotus birth. Um, it's actually waiting entirely for the cord to fall off. They are among our closest relatives. And I think that that is, a, is, is one really fine way for delivery to happen and, and better than the way it's commonly done now. But I'm not trying to get the world to adopt Lotus Birth. I'm glad there are people that are doing that. But I think in terms of a massive change in a year, it needs to be something simple, clear, and really hard to argue against. And that's why TikTok, one simple idea, just wait an extra 90 seconds. And whatever you do after that, um, I'm, I'm happy the way they go. Next question. And now if we could only educate pediatricians about safe co-sleeping as a biologic norm. Yeah, that, that, that's a, that one is, um, is a tough one. And it's tough partly because, again, the fear thing. Um, and again, people look at the statistics and see that, yes, there are um, a bunch of, of deaths that happen in bed, but deaths that happen in cribs are even more common. So however people do sleep, want to sleep, I do think the safety issue is important, that there's not soft bedding, and that if they are with parents, you don't want to have secondhand smoke in the room. You don't want uh, one of the parents that's close to the baby to be on uh, a medication that would make it hard for them to be aware in their sleep of where the baby is, um, and things like that. Next question. The best way to advocate for optimal delayed clamping um, when a doctor is resistant to this, a lot of places now are open to the idea, if parents ask um, for optimal cord clamping, to waiting a little bit. It's, it's unusual to find ducks so far that will take the initiative in that, but they're getting already to the spot where they will respond most of the time. Not, not entirely. There are places in the U.S. and around the world where they just say no. Um, but you might be able to reach a compromise if they say no and just say, uh, this is why. You may want to refer them to this slideshow because at the tail end of it uh, were references of many, many, many studies showing us really well done studies showing the, the benefit for this. And the regulations are starting, or the recommendations are starting to change. In, um, in England, is the first com country in their birthing practice to now say, wait at least a minute after the baby is born. 
So I, I think that will start to spread around the world. Also, uh, the World Health Organization is starting a new medical school in Africa called Next Gen University. And there, there are going to be physicians from more than 20 nations in the first class. And the TikTok program, this program of optimal cord clamping, will be taught as part of the core curriculum there. So hopefully we'll get to spread the, the word that way as well. Um, can damage from low iron be repaired? Um, and let's see. The, the, the answer is it's not entirely clear on that. We know that you can prevent further damage from low iron by giving iron. Um, but it's not clear whether people catch all the way back up to what they would have had before, because it may have been part of development that happened before that. There's still ongoing work into that. Uh, should the baby be placed on mom's abdomen? I think that can be a really nice thing. I, kinda, I prefer the baby to be below the placenta for a little bit first and then up on the abdomen, but either way is likely to be okay. And let's see, breast milk contains low iron, but it's more biologically available, so they shouldn't be deficient from breastfeeding. Breastfeeding isn't the reason that they're deficient, uh, but I think it's the early cord clamping is the reason. Breast milk has the ideal amount of iron for babies, but it turns out that breastfed kids tend to be the ones more likely to get iron deficient because the cord was cut early, not because of breast milk. Do I note there have been studies looking at the correlation between immediate cord clamping and ADD, ADHD, and or autism? Do I think there's a connection? I do think there's a connection. But I have not seen studies done on it uh, directly. The studies that I have seen, the, there was a group that were in France uh, where they, were, they took a bunch of kids in the, in the same classroom. Some had ADHD and some didn't. They measured blood tests to look at iron levels in the kids. And they found that, and all of them had normal hemoglobin on the finger sticks. They weren't anemic but they looked at their ferritin levels, the iron storage levels in the body. And the average of the non-ADHD kids was 44, um, and the average of the ADHD kids was 22. Their iron storage were half the other kids, and uh, I think 85% of them were actually iron deficient, were measurably iron deficient. So it looks like there is a direct connection between brain development in that way as well. Um, are there tools on my website that a pregnant mom could show to her practitioner to convince the extra 90 seconds? Yes. Um, and it's at drgreen.com slash TikTok, T-I-C-C-T-O-C-C, -C -C, including the bibliography. What kind of iron drop supplements are the best absorbed? Um, the biggest thing that actually helps with absorption isn't the difference between the iron drops. It's whether they are getting uh, things in the diet that will help. Breast milk is something that helps improve iron absorption, and citrus is something that helps improve iron absorption. And that is okay to do in the first year of life, even though a lot of people say that it's not. And what's the best way to help spread the word on this? Uh, tell somebody, just tell anybody uh, about it, because people, when they hear, often want to share it with somebody else, and that's the way it's going to change, is people talking to others and asking for it um, when you're having a delivery. And uh, as a doula, and thank you for being a doula, I, uh, doulas are my heroes. Um, but at the moment, to remind the OB, or midwife that, that parents want optimal cord clamping, otherwise the hospital protocol is just kind of uh, make their way through. Um, some docs are very uh, concerned about the baby being held perfectly steady at the height of the placenta. I don't think that makes such a big deal. It, the, the, the pumping is mostly active pumping. Gravity does make some difference. If it's below the placenta, you get a little bit more. If, you're, if it's um, up on the belly and above the placenta, you get a little bit less. But that's not as big a deal as the immediate cord clamping or not. And I, uh, so I don't make that part of this plan. But, uh, but it really, either way is okay. Giraffes, by the way, it's, it, it does go straight down uh, when, when they're dropping. So thank you all. Great to be with you. Oh, do I think it would be easier to okay. convince? Oh, there's, I see questions still coming. Sorry. Um, no worries. Do you think it will be e easier to convince practitioners in developing countries than in the U.S.? Um, I 
think that may be the case. Um, and particularly, though, as the U.S. changes, and it is, it is happening at some major hospitals already, uh, that people do look to us for what is the most cutting edge. And if we changing it here will help spread it around the world, but don't wait for us to change here either. Let's, let's get it everywhere by the end of next year. Dr. Green, we have one final question. It says, if you had to single out one reference from your bibliography when speaking with folks with a shortened attention span or, span or limited time, which would you recommend for TikTok? That's a great question. Let's see. Yeah. <laughs> um, I would probably recommend there was a new one this year um, that was a big review. Let me see if I can find which one that is. I'm not seeing which is the right one. Um, Maybe we can but, um, email it. What, we'll, when we send out the recording, we can yep. add that to the email. How does that sound? That sounds, that sounds really good. Let, Great. Let's do it that way. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Green. Uh, we really appreciate all this valuable information that you shared with our audience tonight. And thanks to everyone for attending. And we hope to see you at another ISIS online event soon. Have a good night. Thank you. Teamwork.